Um, so I am here um, this afternoon for calisthenics and to talk about training self-driving car engineers, because that's my job at Udacity. Um, before we talk about how we train self-driving car engineers, um, I thought you might want to know a little bit about how I got into this. Um, I was, for many years, a web software engineer. Um, that red gem you can see up on the slide there, that's actually the logo for Ruby, um, of Ruby on Rails fame. I was a Ruby on Rails engineer for many years. Um, I was working on recruiting software, and I decided I wanted to change things up, do something a little different. I got really excited about self-driving cars. Um, but I didn't have any background in automotive software, in system software, um, and I wasn't sure how I would get anybody to hire me to work on self-driving cars. Um, and I started searching the internet, and I stumbled upon a class at Udacity um, called AI for Robotics. It's a class um, taught by our founder, Sebastian Thrun, um, and it goes through some of the basics of how self-driving cars work. And I took that class, and then I took other classes at Udacity, and then I took classes at Coursera, and classes at edX, and I started doing projects, um, and then I started knocking on a lot of doors, and eventually I clawed my way onto the autonomous driving team at Ford Motor Company um, at their Research and Innovation Center in Palo Alto, um, which is just an amazing place to work. I really, really love working at Ford. Um, a great team. My, uh, my old boss, Shonak, is here. Um, uh, he's great. The whole team at Ford is terrific, and I was really privileged to work there. Uh, while I was working at Ford, um, the team at Udacity was reading my blog about how I had um, become a self-driving car engineer and my excitement about autonomous vehicles and trying to teach people through my blog about um, what it meant to be an autonomous vehicle engineer. And they contacted me and said, David, um, what would it be like if you came here to, um, to Udacity and helped build out a course to, to teach other people how to do what I had done to become a self-driving car engineer, um, just make it a lot easier and less painful? Um, and so we talked for a while, and, um, and eventually um, I came over to join Sebastian Thrun, the, um, the founder of Udacity, um, to build the self-driving car engineer nano degree. Um, we launched the nano degree in October. Um, it's a nine-month course that takes people through um, the entire technology stack for autonomous vehicles. The goal is to prepare students to work in the autonomous vehicle field. Um, and I'll take you through a little bit of what we cover and what students learn, and then show you a little bit of work that, um, that students have done. So um, we'll start by talking about uh, my partner in this, Sebastian Thrun. Um, Sebastian is um, kind of a luminary in Silicon Valley. He was a professor at Stanford, um, where he won the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge, which was a really famous um, self-driving car race through the Mojave Desert that kicked off the, the self-driving car boom. Um, he left Stanford to go start Google's self-driving car project, which is now known as Waymo, um, and Sebastian built that out. Um, and he then left Google and started Udacity um, uh, to help teach people all around the world how to um, develop software and to democratize education so that anybody anywhere can get um, the world's best education. Um, this past summer, um, I joined the team and we kind of merged Sebastian's interests in both education and autonomous vehicles, and we've been building the um, Udacity Self-Driving Car Engineer Nano Degree Program. Um, it's a real privilege to work with him. So I'd like to take you through a little bit of, um, of what we do in the Self-Driving Car Nano Degree. I'll, I'll walk you through what we cover in the nine months. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what some of the students have done, because I think it's really exciting to see some of the work that, um, that our students have put together. Um, and in the middle, you'll actually learn something, hopefully. Um, so the nine-month program starts out with an introduction, and then we dive into deep learning. Um, deep learning is one of the hottest fields in, in Silicon Valley. It's certainly a super hot field for autonomous vehicles. Um, George Hotz, who spoke this morning, um, is a big proponent of using um, things like deep learning and behavioral cloning um, to, uh, to help train cars to drive themselves. Um, he talked uh, in more depth than I possibly could about um, all of the challenges and advantages of, um, of trying to use deep learning to, to, um, to train vehicles. Um, we do that in about a month. We cover convolutional neural networks and deep neural networks, and the, um, the month ends with students um, building a, um, a network to drive a car in a simulator. Um, so it's a really fun project uh, to actually implement behavioral cloning um, uh, in a simulated environment. 
Um, the next month, the third month of the program after the introduction and deep learning is computer vision, um, where we go over um, more standard computer vision techniques um, for doing things like finding lane lines and um, detecting vehicles on the road. Um, and students um, in that month by building um, a computer vision pipeline to draw bounding boxes around vehicles. And it's really cool by the time you get to the end of that month, you can kind of see um, something that looks a little bit like what you might imagine in, in Tesla Autopilot, um, where you've got the lane lines and, um, and the bounding boxes around the vehicles. And I'll show you um, one of our students who, uh, who uh, completed that project and their approach to it. Um, the next term is another three months. And this term is pretty intensely focused on robotics. Um, so we start out with a month on sensor fusion, um, which is the science of taking LiDAR data, um, like the Velodyne folks create, and radar data, um, like our friends at Bosch and, and other automotive suppliers build, um, and fusing that data together to help the vehicle understand what the environment looks like. Because if the LiDAR tells you that a pedestrian is there and the radar tells you, no, the pedestrian's over there, you have to figure out how to fuse that data together and under understand what, what does the world really look like out there. Um, the next month is localization, um, which helps um, students understand how to figure out where the vehicle is, um, so how to take a high-resolution LiDAR map and then figure out where are we actually on that map. That seems like a really easy problem in the world of GPS, right? You just kind of pull out your phone and your phone says, oh, you're in San Francisco. Um, Self-driving cars need much higher resolution than that. You, you kind of think about driving down the street. Um, if you're off by, you know, 100 centimeters, which I guess is a meter by definition, um, then uh, you might wind up on the sidewalk or hitting something. Um, so you need to know with kind of single digit centimeter level accuracy. Um, where are you in the world? And so we teach students how to build particle filters. That's the project at the end of that month. Um, the, um, the sixth month is control, um, and that's building some of the classical mechanical engineering control algorithms, PID control, linear quadratic regulators. Um, and um, for this project, students go back into the simulator that we use for behavioral cloning um, and deep learning, and they try a different approach to drive the car in the simulator using um, mechanical control algorithms. Um, so all of this is, is kind of project-based learning where there's a project at the end that students are building up to and we're teaching students what do you need to know in order to complete that project and then the goal of the project is, is to have something really cool to, um, to take to employers and say, you know, I know how to, to build parts of the autonomous vehicle stack and I would be a really valuable contributor to your team. Um, our entire guiding star with this program really is jobs. How do we help students get jobs in the autonomous vehicle industry? Um, the last three months of the program are term three. Um, we'll, we have a month on path planning. Um, this is taught in conjunction with our, our partners at Mercedes-Benz. Um, almost all of our modules actually are taught in conjunction with various partners. We work with Uber on controls, um, path planning, and, and localization, sensor fusion with Mercedes-Benz, deep learning with our partners at NVIDIA, as well as system integration NVIDIA is helping us with. Um, uh, we're very heavily tied into industry because you know, what we do is we go out to um, employers and say, what, what do students need to know? What do potential candidates need to know in order to walk in the door at NVIDIA or Uber or Mercedes-Benz or Bosch or PolySync or autonomous stuff and um, be a credible candidate, be a candidate that you would want to hire. Um, so for path planning, we'll be covering trajectory planning and decision making, um, leading up to a, a highway driving project in the simulator with traffic and, and kind of managing a more complex environment. Um, there'll be an elective month in the middle, um, and then the final month um, will be a month on system integration. Um, and the big hook at the end of the whole program, at the end of the system integration month, um, is that students will put their code on a real self-driving car. Um, so Wolfgang um, from Autonomous Stuff mentioned earlier that we purchased a car from them, a Lincoln MKZ, um, and it's kitted out um, with, uh, with all the drive-by-wire hardware necessary, and we've been working on this MKZ to set it up so that at the end of the course, um, the first students will hit this in the summer, um, students will be able to form teams and put their code on the actual vehicle and see if they can get a real vehicle running real software um, like Ross to drive around a, um, a test track. Um, so we, we think of this as what we call an only at Udacity experience. It's the type of um, 
a program and project that you only really get um, at a company like Udacity that has the resources to help students um, get real world experience that they can take to employers and say, you know, not only have I um, built projects, you know, with, with simulated data, but I've actually put my code on the car. Um, so we're very excited about this. Um, we have uh, several thousand students in the program now. Um, uh, we start a new cohort um, every couple of months. Um, and if you're interested, um, we encourage you to come study and learn about self-driving cars with us. Um, so that's kind of the, the high level overview of the program. Um, because I work in education, um, I thought it might be fun to teach folks about um, a little bit of, uh, of the self-driving car technology stack. Um, this, uh, this video clip actually comes from Sebastian's free AI for robotics course. Um, so if you're interested, you can just go to udacity.com. This particular course is available for free. Um, and it covers a little bit about how do we actually control a vehicle. Um, so let's get started and see what Sebastian has to say. Field in control, and many, many classes can be taught about this one subject matter. So what I do is I give you the very basics and let you implement the very basics, and I promise it'll be fun. You'll be able to drive a car around, and the Google car to the present date uses a version of this exact same controllers that's, of course, much more tuned to the specifics of our car. But you get to see some of the essence of what it means to control a car. So here's the problem. Consider the following car with a steerable front axle and two non-steerable wheels in the back. And say we wish this car to drive along this line, which is the output of our smoother we just discussed. Let's assume the car has a fixed forward velocity, but you have an ability to set the steering angle of the car. How would you do this? You would keep the steering constant, you could give random steering commands, or you could set the steering angle in proportion to what's known as the cross-track error, which is the lateral distance between the vehicle and the so-called reference trajectory. So the third possibility is steer in proportion to this cross-track error, CTE. Choose one of those that you think are best suited to control the car. Okay, so this is a little sample of how we teach at Udacity, and it captures one of the core elements of online learning at Udacity, which is quizzes. We have lots and lots of quizzes because it's easy to kind of watch a video and have it kind of wash over you and not really retain it. Having these frequent quizzes helps you kind of stop and, and think about what you just learned and how to apply it. Um, so I'll ask folks. Um, you know, if, if what you want to do is take that car there and you want to get it down to the line and steer it along the line, um, do you want to hold the steering constant? Um, do you want random steering? Or do you want to steer in proportion to the cross-track error? So raise your hand if you want to hold the steering constant. All right, we got, we got, we got a taker. Um, raise your hand if you want to steer randomly. Oh, we got a taker for random steering. All right. Raise your hand if you want to steer in proportion to the cross-track error. All right, well, let's see what the answer is. And yes, you'll steer in proportion to the cross-track error, which means the larger the error, the more you're willing to turn towards the target trajectory. And you can see that this works. As you get closer to the trajectory, your steering will be slower and slower, and you will reach the trajectory. Clearly, the other two answers are really bad. A constant steering will put you in a circle and not in a straight line, and random steering if you ever implement this, is a really bad idea. And believe me, <laughs> we accidentally did this once. It's a really bad idea. All right, OK. So, um, so now we know we want to steer in proportion to the cross-track error. That, that one seemed like a little bit of a gimme, right? I mean, it wasn't the toughest question anybody's ever faced. Um, let's try something that's maybe a little bit tougher. So what you just learned is called a P controller where P stands for proportional. And here is a really tricky question by which I want to test your intuition. One that doesn't have a unique answer, but it has a best answer. Suppose you do what I just said. You steer in proportion to the cross tag error. That is, your steering angle is proportional by a sum factor of tau to the cross track error. What will happen with the car? It never quite reaches the reference trajectory it overshoots, or either can happen. All right, so we've decided we're going to steer in proportion to the cross-track error. Um, and if we do that, 
Um, do we think it's never going to quite reach that, that line, that reference trajectory, or it's going to overshoot the reference trajectory, or it can go either way? Um, so raise your hand if you think it's never going to get there. It can be like asymptotic. Okay, so we have some takers on that. Um, raise your hand if you think it overshoots. All right, a couple people. Raise your hand if you think it can go either way. All right, interesting. Lots of people can go either way. So let's see what the right answer is. And my answer is it actually overshoots. The problem is no matter how small this constant is over here, it would eventually will turn its wheels quite a bit towards its trajectory. Then it will move towards its trajectory more and more. And when it hits it, its wheels will be straight, but the robot itself will still be oriented a little bit downwards. So it's forced to overshoot. What this means that applied to a car, a P controller will act like this. It'll slightly overshoot. And that could be okay, the overshooting is very small, but it'll never really converge. It'll be what's called marginally stable, or often just stable in the literature. Okay, so that was maybe a little bit counterintuitive, um, but that's actually the, the fundamental concept behind what's called a PID controller, which is, is the most common type of mechanical controller. The P is per, for proportional, so we're steering in proportion to the cross-track error, and then um, how we deal with this, this um, oscillation here is called um, the derivative part, so that's the D in the PID controller, and there's actually a third part, the I, um, which is the integral part, and you'll learn all about all of those if you take um, uh, Sebastian's free AI for Robotics course, and you'll learn about them a lot more, along with a lot of other mechanical controllers, um, if you take the Udacity self-driving car nano degree. Um, so this is all great. We can uh, you know, watch videos, kind of think about um, some of the concepts, answer quizzes, but we still don't really know, like, how do we build a PID controller? And this is a big focus of Sebastian. Sebastian has this saying that he, he loves to uh, repeat. I've heard it a thousand times. Um, you don't lose weight by watching other people exercise. So um, the idea uh, behind that and how we apply it to Udacity is that in order to learn how to build autonomous vehicles, you have to write code. Um, and so the next video will show you a little bit about how we do that. So I want you to implement such a controller. So here's the code I've prepared for you. There's a class robot with which you're familiar. It has an init. You can set the position using the function set, as before. There's steering noise and distance noise. You're familiar with this. There's also something called drift, which we won't use right now, but later on it'll become handy. And there's your move command. All the way you've implemented it before. And I've improved a little bit the printout of the coordinates using floats. I wanted to implement the run command, which takes as input the control parameter that governs the proportional response of the steering angle to the cross-track error. The robot has an initial position of 0, 1, and 0, a speed of 1, and I wanted to simulate it for 100 steps. So here's what I envision to happen. Your robot is initially off the x-axis by 1. I wanted to drive along the x-axis, so the y-value is the same as the cross-track error. By turning inversely proportional to the y-value, using a parameter tau that sets the response strength of the proportional controller. I want the robot to turn towards the x-axis, drive in that direction, overshoot, turn around, and drive back. To do this, simulate the robot for 100 steps and use a proportionality term that sets my steering angle alpha in proportion to the cross-track error y. So enter your code here, and when you're done with it, and you run it with the coefficient 0.1, here's the output I want you to produce. It's 100 lines. You can see the robot position starting one off in Y. It then reduces Y over time to go into negative territory. On the right side, you see the store corresponding steering orientation. And you can see, as you move on, the Y coming back into positive territory. And you can see how the robot overshoots slowly around the reference trajectory of the x-axis. So please go implement this. Cool. So I'll stop there. I won't make everybody get out their computers and actually implement that yet. Um, 
but that gives you kind of a sample for how we do education at Udacity. Um, a lot of quizzes, a lot of programming exercises, um, big projects at the end um, that help you put all your ideas into practice and build a portfolio of, um, of a terrific work that you can take to um, automotive employers um, who are looking for candidates to hire who can do these things. Um, so the next thing I'd like to do is, is actually jump out of um, uh, the slide presentation and show you some of the work that our students have done. Because um, I find it really exciting um, when students write up the work that they've done and, and talk about the interesting ways they've approached their projects. Um, and I think you all might be interested in what some of the students have done too. And if some of these projects interest you, it, you know, the, the nano degrees out there, feel free to sign up and um, you can learn how to do these things too. Um, so I'll start with a, um, uh, a project um, by a guy named Joshua Owoyemi. Um, Joshua is a Nigerian student who is a PhD candidate in, at a university in Japan. Um, it kind of illustrates um, what we talk about at Udacity as far as democratizing education. We want to make the world's best education available to people all over the world. Um, and we find it really neat that someone um, you know, on the other side of the world um, and from a whole other side of the world um, gets the opportunity to, uh, to work on these projects with us. So I'm going to pop out here and we'll, um, we'll look a little bit at Joshua's project. Um, so Joshua's project um, has to do with behavioral cloning. George Hotz talked about the, co the high level concept of behavioral cloning earlier in his talk. It's the idea of taking human driving behavior and feeding that data into a deep neural network and training the network, using that to train the network to drive a car. Um, so we do this in a simulator. Um, we built this simulator that you see on the screen right now. Um, it's, it's built kind of like a video game. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of, uh, of a sample of how it works, and then we'll look at Joshua's um, uh, submission. So this is our simulator. Um, you drive it just like a video game. Um, there are a few different tracks you can drive on. Um, if we press the record button up here, it will record our, our driving data. Um, and then we can feed these camera images. The, the driving data um, basically consists of simulated cameras that are sitting on the front of this car. Um, we can feed those camera images and steering angles and other data into a deep neural network and, and train that network to drive the car autonomously. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is pull up here really quickly Joshua's project. Um, so. Um, Joshua wrote a, a really cool Medium post about um, doing behavioral cloning um, uh, on, a, on a simulated track. And so I'd like to just walk through with you a little bit uh, kind of how he approached this project. There are a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, but um, he talks about um, first taking a bunch of different networks. So he talks about this NVIDIA paper. Um, you saw Danny Shapiro talk this morning about their self-driving car. They have a paper they've published on the neural network they use to drive their car. Um, Comma AI, so that's George Hotz's company. They've published a paper about a neural network that they've used. Um, and then there are other people out there. Vivek is another one of our students who's published some, some interesting uh, models. So what Joshua is doing is he's taking all these different networks and he's running his data through these different networks to see how the different networks perform. Um, so first, how does he get the data? Um, well, he goes through and he, um, he drives around the track. He collects a ton of data. He visualizes it. And so this, is, this histogram is what the data looks like. Um, so what you have is this big spike here that um, that is the car driving straight, right? There's zero steering angle. The car is just going straight. And then you have like a little bit of the car turning to the left. And why is this? It's because it's a counterclockwise track. So the car is driving around the track. It turns left a little bit, but most of the time it's going straight. So the problem is you feed this data into the network. The network basically just learns to drive straight all the time. <laughs> then you turn the network on and the car just drives straight off the road. No good. Um, so Joshua does some really cool things as far as choosing images from different cameras. The car actually has three cameras mounted on it. Um, he jitters the steering angles a little bit. He randomly flips them. And so he says if you have a, a, a camera shot that, that says turn left if you see a camera shot like this, he just flips the camera shot and says if you see a flipped version of this, turn right. And that helps the model generalize better so that in the situations where the model does need to turn right, where the car does need to turn right, the car can figure out how to do that. Um, Joshua does some really neat things with color spaces and adding brightness and shadows to the images. And you can see the histogram he winds up with um, 
At the end is a much more balanced histogram. So this is a lot of data of the car driving in a lot of different directions. And this means that the model's going to generalize really well. It's not going to learn to just drive straight. It's going to learn to drive straight and left and right, depending on what the appropriate behavior is. Um, then Joshua talks about diving into the NVIDIA model. And this, um, this image right here is a screenshot straight out of Danny Shapiro's NVIDIA model. Um, this is the model that NVIDIA used to drive um, their BB-8 vehicle. Um, and he implemented this in code. Um, uh, we teach um, you know, how to do this as part of the course. Joshua implemented it. Um, and um, and uh, this is, I should go back and explain, this is what's called a convolutional neural network. You feed data in at the bottom here. These are camera images. Uh, you perform some what's called normalization on the, um, on the images. And then you, um, you run filters over it. Um, uh, and over the course of uh, seven or eight layers here, the car figures out um, or learns whether to steer right or left or straight, depending on what the camera image shows. Um, so then Joshua um, tests his model. So this is Joshua's neural network driving the car autonomously in the simulator. He has some pretty neat music kind of underlying it. Um, I'll turn that down for a second. And you can see this is not Joshua driving the car. This is the car driving itself. You can actually tell because there's this little white dot up here. That's when the car's in autonomous mode. And this is pretty cool. The car looks pretty good. Um, he's built and trained a neural network that, um, that drives a car in a simulator. And then the really cool thing he does um, is um, he takes a second track. So he's trained this car to drive itself um, purely on that first test track that you saw. So there's a second test track that looks a little scarier. Um, and he puts his model on this test track, and lo and behold, the car drives itself. Um, and that's really cool that you could train a car in one environment, or a network to drive a car in one environment, and then you put the network in another environment, and you've done such a great job generalizing the model and showing it how to handle different scenarios that the car drives itself in a different environment. Um, so that's just a sample of one of the projects, you know, what one student did for one project in the um, Udacity Self-Driving Car Nano Degree Program. It's a pretty cool project. We're very proud of it. Um, but we're really, really proud that our students have done such amazing work and tackled it in so many different ways. Um, that's the show. Um, if, uh, if you're interested, we're always happy to talk to folks. Come up and say hello later. Um, and if you're hiring autonomous vehicle engineers, we have lots and lots of students who'd love to work for you. Um, so please come talk to me about that as well. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, David. I, we could probably do one question. So do right here, and then we'll have to move on. I'm actually taking this uh, cooks now, first uh, term. Very good cooks. I, Thank I, you. I this. And one question. There is homework on traffic sign recognition, and you use German uh, database. Uh, do you know if there is a U.S. Uh, traffic sign database? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So this is a, a kind of specific question of the course. One of the projects that we have in the course is to take a traffic sign database and build a neural network to classify the traffic sign. So your network should be able to say, this is a stop sign, this is a yield sign, this is a 60 mile an hour sign. Um, we use the German traffic sign recognition benchmark data set um, because that is the widest publicly available data set. Um, there is not um, an easily accessible US version of that data set. Um, there are a lot of proprietary versions that different companies have. Um, I think if, if I remember right, it's been a while since I looked, if you go online, you can, I think, find some that you can use yourself to, um, to train networks on US traffic signs. Um, but the licensing was such that we couldn't pull them into the course and distribute them to, to students. So we used the, the German traffic sign data set because they had really nice licensing and we could share it with students and, and everything was, was on the up and up. Cool. Um, we can do one more question. I think. Did you? Um, I, I took some Udacity classes before, and sometimes they require, like, if you're working, it's two hours a day of study that they recommend. Is that the same for this class? And also, what are their prerequisites? Yeah, great question. So um, the the prerequisites are um, intermediate level software programming ability, um, ideally in Python or C++, because those are the two languages of the course. But if, if you're familiar with another language, you can probably make that work, as well as basic linear algebra, statistics, and um, calculus. So basically matrix multiplication, integrals, derivatives, um, things like mean, mode, standard deviation. 
Um, uh, you know, the goal is not to take people from nothing to become an autonomous vehicle engineer, but the goal is to take people from being like what I was, a web software engineer, and helping them become autonomous vehicle engineers. Um, as far as how much time to spend in the course, um, we have targeted about 10 hours a week. What we hear from students is students are spending um, about twice that much time in the classroom, and so we're, we're, you know, they're very dedicated. It's really amazing how excited students are about this and, and how much effort they're putting into it. We don't want to burn people out, so we're doing things to, to, um, to make the course a little bit less intense while still retaining a lot of the knowledge that students need to learn. Um, I think you can benchmark somewhere between you know, somewhere around 15 hours a week is kind of, I think, where we're probably going to wind up as far as working on the course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.